All right, once again, good evening. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 20? Exodus 20. And last week in our study, we only just began to get into chapter 20. Of course, Exodus 20 is where God gave the Ten Commandments. And may I just say one more time, they're not the Ten Suggestions. They are the Ten Commandments. And these commandments were eventually written by God on two tablets. Initially, he spoke them, ver spoke them verbally to all Israel, but uh, eventually God wrote them down. Chapter 24, verse 12 tells us, on two tablets of stone. Now, the first tablet contained four laws that governed Israel's relationship with God. And the second tablet, or table of the law, contained six laws that governed their relationship with their fellow men. And uh, we got as far as the third commandment, but let's go back to verse 1. The Lord spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Here's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. So, in this first commandment, God forbid Israel from worshiping any other god but him alone. A commandment against false worship and idolatry. Pretty straightforward. The second one's a little confusing. I think we shed some light in it last week. Verse 4. This is the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image uh, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. We stop there. Again, as we said last time, at first glance, this seems like a repeat of the first commandment where God prohibited the worship of other gods. But where the first commandment forbids the worship of false gods, the second commandment forbids the worship of the true God in a wrong way. We spent a lot of time in this last week, so go back and get the study online or whatever. But this was the mistake, as we said last week, of the children of Israel when they made the golden calf. They, they forced Aaron to make it. All right? They reduced God to an image. That's what he's forbidding in the second commandment. Why is he so adamant about it? Well, as we went into detail last time, what are you going to choose to represent God? If you turn him into an image, uh, the likeness of anything in the heavens above, the earth beneath, under, in the waters underneath the earth, whatever you choose to make to represent God Almighty is going to be a lesser God or a lesser representation because God is an infinite spirit whose presence not only fills the entire universe, it fills all of time, all of eternity. So anything you make to represent God is going to be a false representation. Therefore, to worship it, even if you're thinking of the true God when you're worshiping it, well, that's idolatry. Notice what God goes on to say, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Who's he talking about? These idols that you make to represent them. They're not me. So you make these idols and you make these images uh, to bow down and worship them. He didn't say that to bow down and worship me. That's not me. I'm not that thing, whatever it is that you're fashioning to worship. So, you know, you can bow down and worship those if you want, but you're not worshiping me and it's, it's against what I have said. Verse 5. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Here we go. Over the years, I have had numerous people ask me, if jealousy is a sin, then how can God be a jealous God? How can he call himself a jealous God and not be guilty of sin? Well, the reason he can call himself a jealous God and not be guilty of sin is because the Bible never says jealousy is a sin. It, of course, any violence that comes from jealousy is a sin, all right? But jealousy, guys, and this, you need to understand this. And you know what? <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, this was the very verse that turned Oprah Winfrey against her Christian roots. Because she read this, if I'm not mistaken, I remember her saying this, she read this, the Bible said, God says, I am a jealous God, in her mind, jealousy is a sin, it's wrong, therefore, how can God be a jealous God? It just sort of short-circuited all her faith as she went down the New Age route. 
Jealousy is not a sin. Listen, jealousy is a righteous response towards the one you've entered into a covenant of marriage with when another is trying to come between you or trying to take them from you. It's absolutely legitimate for a husband to be jealous for his wife when he sees another man flirting with her or trying to woo her away from him. And the same is true with God. Alan Redpath really nails it when he said, and I quote, God's jealousy is love in action. He refuses to share the human heart with any rival, not because he is selfish and wants all of us for himself, but because he knows that upon that loyalty to him depends our very moral life. God is not jealous of us, he is jealous for us, end quote. It's really an expression of God's love. Look, he entered into a covenant with Israel, a marriage covenant. And of course, in marriage, he expects us, you know, with each other, to be monogamous, to be committed, to be faithful, right? And when God entered into this covenant with Israel, and after Israel accepted, she was therefore at that point called the... Uh, wife of Jehovah, and whenever she went after other lovers, other gods, God was jealous in the sense that she had made a covenant with him, a covenant of faithfulness and fidelity, and he, of course, made the same covenant with them that he was going to, uh, to cherish them above all the other nations on the face of the earth and bless them and watch over them and so on. There was a mutual commitment there. And God was absolutely righteous in being jealous for Israel when they were went after false gods and you know uh, these other idol lovers that they went after. God was completely justified in uh, being jealous uh, for His wife uh, in her unfaithfulness. <clears throat> so again, verse five: For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, many in the church have used verse 5 as a basis for a doctrine they call generational curses. Maybe you've heard that. Generational curses. I took this definition directly from the website of a deliverance ministry that believes in and promotes deliverance from generational curses. Here's how they define it. These are the folks that are into it. Okay? Here's how they define it. Define it. A generational curse is basically a defilement that was passed down from one generation to another. For example, if your mother has been heavily involved in the occult, then she has become quite defiled, or in other words, polluted and unclean, and has opened herself up to various demons to enter her. The Bible tells us that the sin of the parents can cause that same pollution to be handed down to their children. Now, so far, I agree with some of that, okay? I agree that the actions and lifestyles of parents, well, can affect their children, making them more inclined, more susceptible to those same behaviors the adults or the parents are into, alcoholism, drug abuse, etc. Where I disagree with this, these ministries is when they go on, these deliverance ministries, is when they go on from there and say this, because that, this is a continuation now of the definition I got off this website. What happens, they say, is that not only is the uncleanness handed down, but demons, but demons move right in and take advantage of this often at a very young age in a person's life, often before birth. The person then goes throughout life struggling with the same bondages that their parents struggle with, end quote. So listen to what they're saying, okay? Uh, they are saying that all sinful behaviors are the result of demons living inside a person. In other words, everything from anger to alcoholism, from laziness to lust, is the result of demons that were passed down to you before you were born, by the sins of your parents through what's called generational curses. Now, 
First of all, let me just be clear. The Bible clearly teaches that consequences, not curses, are passed down from one generation to the other. And as I said, the children of alcoholic and or abusive parents will have a tendency to follow in their parents' footsteps. So the behaviors of the parents often get passed down to the children. Drug abuse, alcoholism, abusive personalities, many tests, many studies have proven this. Moreover, the descendants of those who hate God, okay, the descendants of those who hate God are more likely to grow up hating Him because of, listen, let's be honest, because of the example and the indoctrination that their parents instill in them, right? I mean, if you have a parent that's a rabid atheist, a hater of God, you're probably going to grow up a hater of God, just like Madeline Murray O'Hare, okay, and her son William. William, by the way, was the young guy back in the 60s that she used to get prayer thrown out of school. Because they would pray before the day would start. He came home because he didn't he hated God because she brought him up that way. And he would tell his mom they're making me pray. And she took she was a lawyer, took him to court, and wound up getting prayer thrown out of public school. Well, praise the Lord, down the road William became a Christian. And of course she uh, disowned him. Would we'll never speak to him again. She's dead. She was viciously murdered. Uh, but along with our other son and granddaughter. Uh, but you know, God is bigger. God is bigger. But I'm just saying that those who hate God are more likely to raise kids who wind up hating God. Uh, the fact the Hebrew word for hate in verse five is a Hebrew word that means bent. Bent. Parents can and do pass on to their children certain bits, okay, whereby they cause their children to grow bent, often towards the world, and away from God. And in some cases, these bents can be very radical. Children can grow up radically opposing or even hating God. But look, guys, God is not holding children responsible for the sins of their parents, as in the teaching of generational curses. In fact, in Ezekiel 18, you don't have to turn there, but in Ezekiel 18, verse 20, God said, The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. So God is saying, I'm not going to hold the kids responsible for their parents' sins, nor am I going to hold the parents responsible for their children's sins. In fact, earlier in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 2, uh, when Israel, there was a, a, a popular proverb that was circulating in Ezekiel's day. It was a proverb, by the way, that was not biblical. Just one of those proverbs that you, you hear you know, people would like to repeat. It was a proverb that God despised. Okay. And uh, what is it you say? Well, everyone was going around saying this proverb. The fathers eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. What does that mean? Here's what it means. We're being punished for the sins of our fathers. They eat the sour grapes. Why are we, our teeth being set on edge? Okay? Why are we being blamed or held responsible for their sins? That's when God says, uh, no. You're not being held responsible for their sins. You're being held responsible for your sins. And I despise it when people try to pass off onto others the guilt of their sins. It's like our society that no, everybody who's got a problem, it's somebody else's fault. Usually the parents, right? You know? I mean, if you go to any one of a number of psychologists, this is the answer to all our problems. It was our parents, or our upbringing, or our environment. It's never our fault, okay? We're just innocent victims. And this is what God despises. When we try to pass off, excuse, or accuse, other people for our sin. Israel was reaping the consequences of their own continued rebellion. Yeah, the parents had rebelled against God, but the kids were still rebelling against God. And yet wanted to blame the parents for their national problems, which are nothing more than consequences of their sins. You look around in our society today, you can find anyone will tell you it's this person's fault, that person. If you're a Republican, it's a Democrat's fault. If you're a Democrat, it's a Republican's fault. If you're a conservative, it's a liberal's fault. If you're a liberal, it's a, it's a conservative's fault. Okay? 
And pretty much now everyone wants to blame Christians. It's a Christian's fault for everything. All right? And the problems that we are seeing as a nation are the consequences, though, of our own rebellion against God, turning our back on His commandments, His laws. We have nobody to blame but ourselves as a nation. And so this is something God hates. And God says, look, you better knock it off. I'm paraphrasing, but he said, uh, you know, you better knock it off. Okay, you don't, you can't, I don't want to, you, to hear you say anymore. You know, my parents ate this hard grapes. Why are my teeth set on edge? Why am I being punished for their sins? Everyone, he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, everyone is responsible for their own sins. All right? Everyone is responsible for, the, I will not hold the parents responsible for the kids' sins and vice versa. Uh, God, is, and God is saying this in Israel. Uh, but what they, think about what they were saying though, okay? Our problems are due to our parents' issues, their sins. That was a form of this doctrine of generational curses. And again, God was so appalled that in Ezekiel 3 and 4, he was so appalled that he would blame their parents for the consequences of their own sins. Again, he rebukes them and commands them to knock it off. He says, as surely as I live, declares the Lord God, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. I don't want to hear it anymore. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Everyone will be held accountable for their own actions. Guys, generational curses are not found in the Bible. Again, God is saying we're all responsible before Him for our own actions. He will not punish us for somebody else's sins. Alright? Back in Exodus 20, verse 5 and 6, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generations of those who what? Hate me. Okay? These are not, you know, innocent victims. They are continuing in their fathers and mother, their parents' rebellion and hatred towards God. Hatred, and many would say, I don't hate God. Well, yeah, but you're living in rebellion to everything he has said. That's a manifestation of hatred. It's not love. Jesus, if you love me, you keep my commandments. When a person says, I love God, but then lives in rebellion against God, no, what they're saying is, I really hate God. I hate his laws. I hate his control over my life. I'm going to do my own thing. It's an expression of rebellion. But God says, look, I'm going to visit the iniquity on, uh, on the, of the fathers and the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of generations, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Let me just say this. There is a generational curse found in the Bible, just one. I'm sure you can... Think about what that is. I, I'm sure you know what it is. All right? There's only one found in the Bible. And that is the one in which all of us were born with the curse of Adam upon our lives. Passed down from one generation of fallen sinners to the next. In fact, we read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die. See, that's the curse. Even so in Christ. All shall be made alive. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as through one man's offense, Adam's, Adam's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Guys, look. We have all been born into this world as cursed sinners, haters of God, which we manifest that. We, we prove we're haters of God and that we live in rebellion there against everything he has said. And as cursed sinners, we all have the wrath of God abiding upon us, or in other words, eternal judgment hanging over our heads in Adam, in Adam. But once a person comes to Jesus Christ, everything changes. We change families, you know. You heard the old saying, you can pick your friends, you're stuck with your family. That's not true. Okay, that's not true in Christianity, all right. Once you receive Christ, you change families. 
You're no longer children of Adam, and therefore under the curse of our father, Adam. Now we are children of God, members of his family, and as such, the blessings and the mercy of our Father God is now upon our lives forever. We've gone from cursed sinners to blessed children. Children of Adam, in him all die. Children of God, in whom we'll live forever in his presence in glory. So, I guess I do believe in generational curses, but only one. Okay? And I'm just so blessed that you know, God has given us a way to escape the curse of Adam, you know, and find everlasting life in the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And when we accept him, we have passed from death to life. We shall never come into condemnation, John 5, 24, Romans 8, 1. Uh, amazing. All right, well, that brings us to the third commandment, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, often people interpret this to mean God is forbidding his people from, you know, using the name of God, including, of course, the name of Jesus, as a cuss word. It's, a, it's interesting, isn't it? Think about this. You're walking by some construction site. Some guy's hammered a nail into something. He misses the nail, hits his thumb. Do you hear him cry out in a cursed kind of a tone? Oh, Buddha! <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed! <laughs> there do that. <laughs> no, but they say GD, they say Jesus Christ in a very derogatory way. To me, that proves that Jesus Christ is the way. Because Satan hates that name, and he wants his people as much as they can to curse that name. I, I don't know. That for me, it, it proves nothing to the skeptic, but for me it's just one other little indication that our God is the true and living God. But, you know, a lot of people interpret this to mean that God is forbidding his people from using his name as a cuss word. And certainly we shouldn't do that. Okay. But the idea of using God, the name of God in a profane way was something the Hebrews, listen, never did. Like Americans do. He, in fact, the Hebrew language doesn't even have any cuss words. If a Jew wants to curse, he has to do it in English, basically. <laughs> so then, what is God saying here when he forbids his people from taking his name in vain? Well, it probably has to do with using the name of God in an oath or a promise. But then breaking your oath or promise, making the name of God, listen, the one the promise was built upon, a worthless thing. The word vain is a Hebrew word that means, remember Ecclesiastes, when Solomon was talking about life under the sun? What did he kept saying? Vanity, vanity, everything is emptiness and vanity. Where? Under the sun. From an earthly perspective, you've got to get up into the heavenlies and look at this life from an eternal perspective. Get your perspective right, okay? But Solomon spent a good chunk of his life pursuing happiness on a physical, earthly level. And everything he tried never brought him the, the happy. We talked about this last week. But he would, he would, everything would end with vanity, vanity. What does that mean? Emptiness, vapor, it's a smoke. It's like a, the, the Hebrew word is actually where we get our word soap bubbles from, okay? I mean, soap bubbles, you know, they're there, boop, they're gone. And that's happiness in the in, in human realm, okay? So when we take the name of God in vain, we are either using it as an oath or a vow and then not fulfilling what we have promised, and therefore we're making God's name a worthless thing, all right? Or when we proclaim his goodness and his power, to others. And then we act like he can't even provide the rent or a job. Are we taking his name in vain then? Oh, I sure speak a good, I sure talk a good talk. It's like Job's friends said to him, you're the guy that's always uh, strengthening the feeble needs, but now it's come upon you and you try. All right? Now you're good at telling everybody else, hey, trust God. 
But now it's happening to you, the adversity, and you're not so hot now. I mean, we all fall into it, don't we? We're taking the name of God in vain. Uh, but I do think primarily he's talking about using his name in an oath or a vow and then not keeping it. Uh, in Leviticus, Leviticus 19, verse 12, it reads, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of, the, of your God. I am the Lord. So again, God ties it to the swearing of an oath or a vow. Okay? And uh, look, you shall not use my name in vain, basically, by swearing falsely in my name. Right? Leviticus 19, 12. I like what Warren Worthy said along these lines. He said, and I quote, Your name stands for your character and reputation. What you are and what you do when you say that someone has a bad name. You're not criticizing what's written on his birth certificate. You're warning me that the man can't be trusted. If God is the greatest being in the universe, then his name is the greatest name and must be honored. The first petition in the Lord's Prayer is, Hallowed be thy name. People blaspheme God's name by using vulgar language, but using God's name in making a promise or taking an oath and then not fulfilling the commitment is cheapening his name and blaspheming God. End quote. Serious stuff. Now, of course, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount that we shouldn't make vows or oaths using God's name in our normal dealings with people, but that our word should be good enough. Okay? They, see, the Pharisees and scribes were such rotten scoundrels, all right, that they felt like they had to kind of add weight or force to their promise, because, you know, nobody believed them. You know, normally, but they weren't better than work. So they would say, they'd make a promise and then say something, you know, like, uh, by all that's high and holy, you know, by the name of God, I promise to do this. And Jesus is saying, look, you know what? If you have to invoke the name of God by, when you simply give your word, it says that there's something wrong with your word, your character. In fact, turn to Matthew 5. Your word should be good enough. I shouldn't have to say, I promise by my mother's honor. Well, what's wrong with your honor? Okay? It's <laughs> your honor good enough. You know? But Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount that we should make vows or oaths in God's name in our normal everyday dealings with people. Our word should be good enough. Matthew 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said of, to those of old. Now, the Pharisees picked up on this, and of course, uh, he's really quoting them, their teaching. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. That was the Pharisees taking from, Levitic, uh, from uh, Exodus uh, here, the uh, third commandment, basically, and modifying it. But they were teaching essentially the same thing. You know, Again, you have heard that it was said of old. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it, is, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So I think we get the picture, right? Uh, you know. Everything belongs to God. Whether you talk about the heavens or the temple or whatever. Everything belongs to God. And so he's saying, look, no matter what you swear by, really, God's involved. And if you can't just let your yes be yes and your no be no without adding weight by invoking God's name or whatever, then there's something wrong with your character. And that's up to devil with it. But again, but... Something else, guys, to understand, the Lord went on to teach that if you do make a vow, you had better, you better keep it. He says, look, don't make vows. But if you do, you had better keep, keep that vow. Because he goes on to say, the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, of course, this warning from God that if a person used his name in an oath or a vow, 
and then didn't do what they promised they were going to do, God says, I will hold you accountable, and there will be consequences to pay. He said, what kind of consequences? I don't know. But God is just making a point here. He is say, saying, look, if you use my name in an oath or a vow or some kind of a promise, and then you don't come through, you have, you have used my name in vain, and I will hold you accountable. I'm not saying he's going to take them off the earth or anything like that, zap them and wipe them out. But there will be some kind of consequences. Okay? I think the biggest one is going to be, as the book of Proverbs says, um, a good name is to be is more valued than great riches. You know? If, if you, God says he puts his word even above his what? His name. I mean, our word is important. We should be people of our word. In fact, the psalmist said, if you give your word, blessed is the man, it says, blessed is the man who swears to his own hurt. What does that mean? He swears in giving his word, but then finds out later to keep his word is going to be detrimental to him. He's going to lose money on the deal. But he's going to make some money, he entered into the agreement, gave his word, now finds out he's going to lose money on the deal. But if he's a righteous man, They'll say, because I gave my word, it doesn't matter if I lose the money, my character is more important. I don't want to lose my character, my reputation. Money, God can take care of that. If I lose my character, you know, if nobody believes me because I'm not a man of my word, I've lost a lot more than just a few bucks on this deal, right? Now, this warning, guys, <laughs> by the Lord towards those who do take his name in vain, has caused so much paranoia among the Jewish people that they even refuse to write the word God on paper. You ever see a Jew write the word God? It's G-D. Okay, why do they do that? Because they're afraid that if they write the name God on a piece of paper and somehow the piece of paper gets destroyed, then they wrote his name in vain. So, you know, I mean... We know, we know that that's not what God meant, okay? But they were a little paranoid about doing this, all right? All right. The fourth commandment, verse 9. Here's a doozy now, guys. Stay with me, okay? And we're only going to get as far as this one tonight, okay? We'll finish with this one. And I know that you've heard me talk about this. There are some new faces. And Well, let me just get into it. And I'll, okay, we'll, we'll just get into it. The fourth commandment. Okay, verse 9. God says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, there are many Christians who are what is known as Sabbatarians. What is a Sabbatarian? They are those who believe that we are still under the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and therefore we are commanded to keep the Sabbath. Now, they say that, well, the Sabbath for Israel was Saturday, but for the Christian, it's Sunday. They changed the day of the Sabbath. But this idea is gaining momentum. Uh, it's gaining momentum in the Christian church. In fact, uh, I know, I've heard one, one pastor who believes in this, who said that he felt guilty about going out to a restaurant after church on Sunday, because by doing so, he was making the cooks and the waiters, you know, work on the Sabbath, violate the Sabbath, and so he still went out, he just felt guilty about it. All right? It's not for me now, I just, I feel bad about it, but I'll have a hamburger and fries, you know, but... <laughs> anyway, um, this is gaining momentum, okay? It's, it, it's catching on with a lot of younger people because there are some really cool uh, Calvinists nowadays, okay? Young, cool, uh, Matt Chandler and other guys, you know, and and uh, I don't know if Matt believes in the Sabbath. Not all Calvinists do, but uh, but it is rooted in Reformed and Calvinist uh, beliefs. A lot of it is, and uh, so you know, as 
some of these younger Calvinists are, are you know, their ministries are, are prospering. Uh, they're attracting younger people to these doctrines. And so this idea that Christians are still under the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and therefore have to uh, keep the Sabbath is really gaining momentum in the church. But what about this? Is it true that Christians are still under the Sabbath law? Well, there's several things about the Sabbath that we need to understand. First of all, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, you don't have to turn there. Which, of course, Moses quotes uh, when he wrote Exodus 20, verse 11. He quotes Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Uh, even though it says that God rested on the seventh day in Genesis 2, the word Sabbath isn't uh, used there. In fact, the first time the word Sabbath appears in the scriptures is in, Je is in ex uh, Exodus uh, 16, verse 23, where, listen, where God gave it to Israel as a law. God gave it to... It. First time the word Sabbath appears, Exodus 16, 23, was the first time God brought it out and gave it as a law to Israel. In fact, we read in Exodus 31, verse 16, that God gave the Sabbath to Israel, listen, as a sign of the Mosaic Covenant. Turn to chapter 31. Exodus 31. I want to read this to you, okay? It says, verse 16, Therefore, who? The children of Israel. Now, if God wanted to say all mankind, he could have done that here. Because there are those who believe that the whole human race is under the Sabbath, okay? But therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. To observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Listen, the Sabbath was the sign of the Mosaic covenant. Every covenant that God gave, gave had a sign. Something that would be an outward symbol of the spiritual reality God was communicating. So uh, the Noahic covenant was the rainbow where God promised never again to, uh, to wipe out the earth with a flood. You have the Abrahamic covenant, the sign of which was circumcision. You have the Mosaic covenant, the sign of which was the Sabbath. But this was a covenant that God made with Israel. Therefore, the sign of the covenant, the Sabbath, was only intended for Israel to observe. Now, there are many who believe that since God singles out the seventh day for special mention in Genesis 2 verse 3, when it says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, they take note of that. Well, God did single it out. He didn't call it the Sabbath, but he did single out the seventh day for special mention. And they say since this special mention of the seventh day preceded the Mosaic Covenant by 2,500 years, was, they claim it means that the Sabbath transcends the Mosaic Covenant and applies to all mankind, even to Christians living under the New Covenant. So we're still under the Sabbath law, many of these folks believe. And these are Christians who love the Lord, very committed to the Scriptures, okay? They're not weirdos. Many of them are very solid, godly Christians and teachers. I disagree with this, but I see where they're coming from, all right? However, guys, nowhere in the Old Testament does God ever give the Sabbath as a law to the Gentiles? He never says that the Gentiles are to observe the Sabbath. He only gives it as a law to Israel under the Mosaic Covenant. And for that matter, when it says that God rested on the seventh day, he doesn't apply to Adam and Eve. In fact, he, he, man is not even mentioned in connection with God's seventh day rest. Now, why did God rest? Because he was tired? No. The Hebrew means ceased from activity. So God created everything he wanted to create in six days. Then he ceased from activity. He stopped. He was done. Okay? But when he said he rested on the seventh day, he doesn't apply that to Adam and Eve. He says, okay, now because I'm resting, you're going to rest on the seventh day every week. Okay? He doesn't say that. In fact, 
when it came to this man, Mr. and Mrs. Man, Adam and Eve, they didn't need to rest from their labor because guess what? They didn't need to work to feed themselves. Everything brought forth at that time before the fall, everything brought forth on its own. God said, you want the work into the sweat of your brow to, to grow your grain, to make your bread and so on. Everything is going to grow by itself. All you need to do is harvest and enjoy me and just rest. Okay? So we know initially it didn't apply to Adam and Eve, but they didn't have to rest from their labors. And again, even though it says that God rested from his creative work on the seventh day, and blessed it and sanctified, he gave no mandate. Once I just, again, to repeat myself, he gave no mandate in Genesis 2, verse 3, that man was to observe the Sabbath. So then the question arises, and here it is, then why did God sanctify the seventh day and bless it when it wasn't to be observed as a day of rest? Listen to me. I didn't say the seventh day wasn't to be observed at all as a day of rest. Um, all I'm saying is that it was not given to all mankind is a law to be obeyed, but rather was intended by God as a principle to be observed. Look, it makes good sense to rest one day out of seven, especially if you're working in an agrarian society, an agrarian culture, agriculture, and there's, there was no, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, motorized, uh, you know, machinery that could help you plant your crops and harvest your crops. Everything was done by, by hand, okay? And so when you're working like that just to survive and to grow things to live, of course, taking one day off to let your body rest is good, okay? And God knew that. Just from a practical standpoint, the Sabbath rest was a good thing to do, even for us in our crazy, you know, workaholic society. It's good to take one day to rest. And I don't mean, you know, not work and take the kids to five activities uh, or whatever. I'm talking about getting some room. Let your body and your mind rest. Again, worse be said, and I quote, Jehovah is the God of time as well as the Lord, Lord of eternity. It was he who created time and, ex and established the rotation of the planets and their orbits around the sun. It was he who marked out the seventh, seven day week and set aside one day for himself. Every living thing that God has created uh, lives a day at a time except humans made in God's image. People rush around in a frantic rat race of life, always planning to rest but never seeming to fulfill their plan. It has been said that most people in our world are being crucified between two thieves, the regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow. That's why they can't enjoy today. Relying on modern means of transportation and communication, we try to live two or three days at a time only to run headlong against the creation cycle of the universe, and the results are painful and often disastrous, unquote. Yeah, they take the form of nervous breakdowns, all kinds of anxiety disorders, and so on. But let me say one more time, before we move on, the Sabbath, Sabbath was never given to mankind as a universal law. It was only given to Israel as a sign of the Mosaic covenant. Nowhere in the New Testament is the church ever commanded to keep the Sabbath. On the contrary, we read in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, Let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is what? Christ. A shadow contains no substance, but is cast by something or someone of substance. The Old Testament feasts, sacrifices, and the Sabbaths all pointed to Jesus, who was himself the substance. He said, the volume of the book, it is written of me. However, once the reality has come, we no longer need to live in the shadow. Now we live in Christ. Again, who is the film of all these Old Testament types of pictures, sacrifices, and feast days, and new moons, and Sabbaths, all of it pointed to Jesus Christ. You see, what Paul is talking about here in Colossians is that there were those in Paul's day that were trying to put Gentile Christians under the Mosaic Law. In fact, they taught. These were the Judaizers. Many of them were Pharisees who claimed to have received Christ as Lord and Savior, but instead of operating under grace, 
They were teaching that for a person to be saved and to believe in Christ, they first had to become a Jew, get circumcised, keep the law of Moses. And then they could believe in Christ for salvation and be saved. Right? So they were putting the law between the Gentiles and Jesus, basically. And Paul was furious about that. In fact, that was one of the, the main issues that the first church council was convened in Acts 15. Uh, this very issue. Do the Gentiles have to become Jews first before they can be Christians? And of course, it was blown out of the water. No, of course they don't. First of all, we couldn't even keep the law as Jews. We're going to make them wear a yoke of bondage we couldn't even wear ourselves? It's ridiculous that they have to become like we were. We couldn't even, as Jews, we couldn't keep the law. And of course, that was the purpose of the law, to show them they couldn't be righteous by the law. They blew it constantly. The law was intended to drive them to Jesus, right? So the, the Gentiles just bypassed that whole law thing and just got accepted Christ. And uh, But in Paul's day, there were those who were trying to put the Gentile Christians under the Mosaic law and were condemning them for not keeping the Jewish feasts, including, listen, including the Sabbath. And Paul made it clear in Galatians that New Testament believers are not under the law of Moses. In, Gen in Galatians 3, verses 24 and 5, and we talked a little bit about this last time, so bear with me. But in Galatians 3, verses 24 and 5, we read, Paul says, Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. And the Greek is pedagogos, uh, a slave who watched over a rich couple's kids and would take them by the hand and bring them to school. And Paul is saying that it was the law's responsibility to take us by the hand and bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, in other words, after we are born again of the Spirit because of our faith, he says we are no longer under a tutor. We don't need the law anymore, okay? We're no longer under the law. I mean, once the law, and I, bear with me, you've heard me say this, once the law does its job and shows us our sin, and proves to us our inability to keep the law or any kind of self-righteousness, okay, uh, works that I do myself to bring myself righteousness, um, the law shows me I can't keep the law, I break it constantly, and so on. And uh, once the law does its job by frustrating me in showing me I can't keep it, then it drives me to Jesus for another way. I can't keep the law, Lord. Is there another way for me to get to heaven? Yes. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And once the law drives us to Christ for his righteousness, the purpose of the law has been fulfilled in our life. Again, it's kind of like the initial rockets that were used to propel the space shuttle off the uh, launching pad into outer space free of Earth's gravity. You know those two big, massive uh, rockets on the sides of the space shuttle? It's been a while, I think they stopped the program, but you remember that, okay? These two massive rockets, and their sole purpose was that they, they would carry the shuttle uh, uh, out of Earth's gravity into outer space, and once they had fulfilled their purpose in bringing the shuttle to outer space, what happened? They were jettisoned. They were no longer needed. The same is true with the law. After the law has brought us to Jesus for his righteousness, and we become Christians by our faith in Jesus, then the purpose of the law has been fulfilled. The law is jettisoned. Jettisoned. But listen, look, I want you to understand this now. Don't lose me. It's jettisoned as laws carrying punishment, but not jettisoned as the character of God to be emulated by his children. The law just moves inside. Once we accept Christ, God writes them on our hearts. Okay? That was the, the big advantage of the new covenant over the old covenant. The old covenant contained external laws written on tablets of stone. Those could never really keep people from sin. And so what God did in the new covenant, he said, this coming in day, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and all those who believe in Israel's Messiah. Not like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I brought them by the hand out of Egypt, that covenant which they broke. In the new covenant, I'm going to write my laws in their hearts. And they're going to want to obey me from the heart. See? 
So when we say the law has been jettisoned, yeah, as a, as a vehicle to make us righteous, but it still expresses the character of God. Romans 7, 12, the law is holy and just and good. Why? Because it expresses the character of God, and God's character is... There was nothing ever wrong with the law. It was in our inability to keep it. That was the problem. We were weak. Paul even says that in Romans 7. I mean, the problem was not with the law. It was God's righteous standard. The problem was with us in our inability to keep it through the weakness of our flesh. That's why God took it away from us in the new covenant. And simply, Jesus lived the perfect life. He fulfilled all of the law. Matthew 5, 17. I have come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In Christ, Christ fulfilled it all. And when we are saved, we are placed where? By the Holy Spirit. In Christ. We are hidden in Christ. And therefore, everything Jesus did, well, we have been partakers of. But again, guys, the law is, expresses God's character. But once you're saved, the character of God has moved into your heart. Peter said we have become partakers of the divine nature. It's inside us. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Timothy 1. In fact, why don't you turn there? I know you want to write these down. I know you want to memorize them. Don't laugh. You should sure want to. <laughs> Right, Pastor Spell. <laughs> I want to see you guys memorize these. Come on. Well, listen to what Paul says, 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it what? Lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Now, how do you use the law rightly? Well, you don't use it by, to, to make yourself righteous. In other words, you don't keep the Ten Commandments because by keeping those commandments, you think you're going to earn heaven. That would be using the law unrighteously. I use the law righteously when I let it condemn me. And teach me I can't keep that law perfectly, and it drives me to Jesus. Therefore, he said, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Once you receive Christ and you're righteous, you don't need the law anymore. But for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners. God gave the law really for sinners, to show them their sin, to drive them to Christ. Look, in our society we have laws. Why? Because there are evil people out there. And if there wasn't some form of consequence for breaking the law and violating your rights, then it would, sin would run right. There has to be consequences. But as a Christian, do you need laws to tell you not to steal? Not to murder? Not to commit adultery? Of course not. You know why? Because in your heart you would never want to do those things. Oh, we might fall once in a while, but really, we don't desire those things. Because God has, you know, he has put his laws in our hearts and we desire to obey him because we love him. Romans 10, verse 4. For Christ, listen now, is the what? End of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So once you receive Christ, the law is done. The law is done. Now, let me just say this. Again, I'm not saying that the law is done in the sense that we don't have to keep it. It's done in the sense that God is given us now through Christ and the Holy Spirit living inside of us, the power to live it through the power of God, not through our own strength. So it's not like we're saying, well, I can be lawless. I don't, I'm saved by grace. I don't have to observe the law. I can, I can lie, I can steal, I can cheat, whatever. Of course not. Anyone who calls himself a Christian and believes that, or sin, let sin that grace may abound, that person doesn't know Jesus. They, they, they may think they know him, but they don't. Because you can't live an unholy life with the Holy Spirit living inside you. It just won't work. He will convict you up one side, down the other. He won't let you have a moment's rest until you stop messing around with sin and get your life right with him. And you know what? That's a good thing, isn't it? Go to the person who calls himself a Christian and lives in sin without any remorse or guilt or shame or conviction. Wow. And God chases his kids. 
person says I'm a child of God lives like that and has no remorse or guilt, to me, you're an illegitimate child. You're not, you don't belong to God. So we, we understand this. If you love me, keep my commandments is the idea. Okay? But um, again, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. And since we are in him, the law has been fulfilled in us as well. And you say, well, including the Sabbath? <laughs> yeah, including the Sabbath. In fact, the New Testament says that Christ is our Sabbath rest. Read Hebrews chapter 4. For the Christian who is in Christ, and all Christians are in Christ, listen, every day is a Sabbath, a day of worship and rest from our work to get us into heaven. We're resting in Jesus. He's our Sabbath, right? Jesus is our Sabbath rest, which means, and we're done. Now. Jesus is our Sabbath rest, which means as Christians, we're not violating the Sabbath by not setting aside one day out of the week to rest and worship God. Because for us who are in Christ, well, every day is a Sabbath where we worship our God, okay? Do we only worship God on Sunday? We worship God all week long. I mean, do we only rest in Christ on Sunday mornings? Or and then the rest of the week we're working like crazy to earn our salvation? Or do we rest in Christ every day of our life? Yeah. So, Jesus Christ, you're violating the Sabbath. You're not, oh, I'm not. I'm fulfilling the Sabbath more than you. You set aside one day a week. I'm, I'm resting on the Sabbath all week long. Okay. Um, now, the question is, well, then is it wrong, therefore, for a person to set aside one day as a special Sabbath to observe? Certainly not. You can do that. Listen, as long as they don't try to make it a universal law for all Christians to obey you want to set aside one day, call it a Sabbath, and just use it to worship God and so on? Go for it. But don't make it a universal law that the rest of us in the body of Christ have to obey or else we're sinning if we don't do that. Okay? Even as Paul said in Romans 14. Last scripture. Why don't you turn to Romans 14. <clears throat> I don't know, I think this nails it, but there are those who don't see it that way. Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, where Paul says, look, one person esteems one day above another, every, uh, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. Listen to what Paul is saying. And I really believe he's got the Sabbath in mind. Okay? He's saying what? If somebody wants to set aside one day a week to really worship God, because they love the Lord and think that's the right thing to do, go for it, God honors that. He looks, he looks at the heart. Another person says, no, for me, every day is the Sabbath. I, I worship God and love Him and praise Him every day. Paul said, that's good too. And God honors that, because your heart's right. Where we get into trouble is we try to impose our convictions on each other. And now I'm wanting you to observe one day above all the others as a Sabbath and so on. Look, guys, if the Sabbath law was still in effect and applicable to the church, Paul would have not taken such a lax position on those who didn't set aside one day as the Listen, he wouldn't have taken such a lax approach or position on those who didn't set aside one day as the Sabbath, but treated every day as a special, but treated every day as a special day of worship and communion with the Lord. Now, if Paul the Apostle had believed that the Sabbath was still in effect and that Christians were to observe one day as a Sabbath, he would never have said this. He would have said, listen, the Sabbath is still very important. You need to observe it. This is God's law. We're under the law. He doesn't say that. He says, look, you want to observe one day a Sabbath? Go for it. If you don't, every day is a Sabbath. That's good too, right? In fact, when the church was born, right from the very beginning, Christians did not worship the Lord on the Jewish Sabbath, Saturday. 
What did they worship the Lord? First day of the week. Why? Because that was the day Jesus rose from the dead, right? They called it the Lord's Day. So right from the very beginning, if this was really, if we were still under the law of the Sabbath, then the church would have kept worshiping the Lord on the Sabbath or Saturday, but they didn't. Right from the very beginning, they worship the Lord on Sunday because that was the day Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, I, I could talk a lot more about this, but I think you got the gist of it, okay? And uh, really, guys, that concludes then uh, the commandments written on the first tablet of the law which dealt with Israel's relationship to God. And next time we'll look at the second table of the Decalogue which deals with Israel's relationships with their fellow men. And yes, us too, to a certain degree, but again, we're not under the law as a binding thing with punishments if you don't keep it, but these are principles that we should obey because it's the character of God. But anyways, next time we'll study the second table of the law and uh, get into something to start the study that I wanted to bring out today, but I'm so glad I did because it would have taken us well past our ending time. And after a while, I, just, I see your eyes glaze over. I say, you know, I can go on and on. You know, based on this person of myself, <laughs> that's counterproductive. Uh, but when God said, keep the Sabbath holy, for in six days the Lord worked, worked on the seventh day he rested, therefore you're to work six days, on the seventh day you're to rest. That <coughs> statement blows out of the water what I believe is a false a false theology called the day age theory. Now we're just touching it briefly, so don't be nervous. We're just touching it briefly, then we'll get right into our study of the second table of the Lord, right? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that Father, as we study, your spirit gives us illumination and Lord the grace to apply it. And Lord, that's the goal. We're not under laws written on tablets of stone that if we violate, we are punished. But no, Lord, now in the New Covenant, you've written your laws in our hearts. They express your character. And Father, we don't want to be liars or cheaters or adulterers or whatever it might be. We want to be people who represent you properly. You've given us your name. We represent the family name, Lord. And when we go out into the world, we should honor that as a sacred trust. That we would always do things that bring honor and glory to your name. And so, Lord, give us grace and strength. It's so easy to look to live in a world that's so dark and corrupt that we begin to compromise. Well, we're not as bad as them. Lord, the goal of our Christian life isn't to not be as bad as the lost, it's to be as good as Christ, which we'll never attain to, but he's the goal. So Lord, give us grace to walk in your truth, to be a light in this dark world, and again, to bring honor and glory to your great name. We ask all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.